Good evening, Donna. How are you? Fine, and we can see your slides. We're all raring to go. So as we're ready back to school this this week, off we go. <laughs> Fabulous. Thanks very much, Donna. Um, so as you said, my name is Katrina. Um, half an hour is not a long time, but I'll try and cram in as much as possible and hopefully answer some questions at the end. So back to school. Um, I hope that your child is happier than uh, my child in this photograph, if I can get my slides up. Um, that was him on his first day of school in secondary school. And that's not even the dyslexic child that I have. So he was desperately unhappy at school. Um, it can be a really difficult time, can't it, for the neurodiverse child. Firstly, their routine is disrupted by the summer holidays and then they get used to the summer holidays and then that then plunge back into new environments, new travel arrangements, new classrooms, new teachers. Sometimes it's even uh, noisier for them and they have to get used to things like undressing and dressing quickly before and after games lessons. And that can be incredibly difficult for the dyspraxic child. So there's lots to think about, aren't there, for, for your child going back to school. I don't know if all of your children have gone back to school or some of you may have done a couple of days. Um, one idea is perhaps um, practice the new routine with your child if you have a new route. It might be useful to practice some what ifs. What do you think you might do if you have a supply teacher instead of Miss X today? And so they start preparing for all eventualities. One story I was told was about their child who was autistic um, and they had practiced the school route all summer on the bus going to the new school. And the mother was very confident that her son would be fine on the first day. But on that first day, the school phoned up to ask why he hadn't turned up. And uh, she realized that actually nobody had told him that when he got to the school, he should actually get off the bus. And so she found him at the bus station. He'd gone round and round on the route. Um, so it can be those things that trip up children as well. Very difficult if you have got a child who's slightly on the autistic spectrum with all of these things to do with change, even things like not knowing your left from your right. How do you know how to get to the classroom if uh, you ask somebody the way to the classroom and the person says, well, it's the third door on the left down that corridor, for example. I think as parents, it can be very easy to um, not be very patient with your child. Um, I remember doing a parent's course for some children and a father asked me if he could ask a question. I said, yes, of course, go on. And he said, how do I stop myself from wanting to strangle my child? Um, and we all often feel like that sometimes. It can be very, very difficult. So be patient and understand that your child may experience fatigue, especially if they're doing a longer day. So for the child who's been doing a half a day, who's suddenly doing a full day, they're going to be exhausted, aren't they? Brain activity in a dyslexic child is five times greater than that of the non-dyslexic child because they're consistently and constantly trying to keep up with the other children in the class. Even concentrating till four o'clock may be very difficult for children, particularly if they've been used to doing what they want to do during the summer holidays, all of a sudden going back into that structured classroom environment and concentrating all day. It's gonna be very difficult. And these are things that children don't grow out of. I see dyslexic adults who have difficulty um, concentrating past four o'clock as well, actually. I think as parents, um, be aware that picking your child up after a long day, they're going to find it difficult to settle down to homework or go to after school clubs and things. They really need to, to re-energize themselves and um, have a bit of a break, something to eat before they do anything. It's very important that you find a location in the same place every day for homework away from distractions. If there are any noises around, um, 
that can make it very difficult for them to get down and do the study that they need to do. You might want to invest in some noise defending headphones maybe which block out noise if you, you have got a noisy household. You probably know but dyslexic children have good days and bad days um, so don't be complacent if it's all going very well. Um, tomorrow may be completely different um, and children themselves understand that they have these good days and bad days or as one adult said to me recently it's good months and bad months they find it incredibly frustrating themselves well, one of the things that I have found that dyslexic children have particular difficulty with is with time with the concept of time I'm sure you've noticed it as well when you've said to your child, oh, come on, we've got five minutes to get out of the door and, and they look at you blankly. Um, this really came home to me when I went and visited a school and sat in a science lesson in a big, um, big school in, in London and really noticed how teachers were barking out commands about, well, you've got 20 minutes to finish this experiment. You've got 10 minutes to the end of the lesson. You've got five minutes to pack away. Um, I knew that the dyslexic children in that classroom had no idea what in five minutes actually was, what in 20 minutes actually was. So maybe if you've got some time, try and help your child understand um, the concept of time and time passing. What you find is with many children is that they, they don't ever use to use a conventional watch. Um, and many adults can't tell the time on a conventional watch either if they're dyslexic. Things like egg timers can be really handy and there are various companies that sell um, larger egg timers so that if you've got five minutes um, then you can say that to your child um, have a look at the passing of time and that is five minutes. Um, an adult that I've recently assessed um, she said she's constantly late for work because she goes into the shower and she thinks she's only been in the shower for five minutes comes out and she finds that she's been there for 20 minutes and so we talk to her about setting an alarm on her her clock on her mobile phone before she goes into the shower so lots of resources that are out there um, that can really help parents I think I think if you finished the term last um, in July with concerns about your child, um, one of the first things to do is to make an appointment with the SENCO um, this term. And this is an opportunity to see what they'll put in place for your child and to see how the school will monitor progress. Um, it's really important to see what the school will put in place and to give the school a chance to put things um, right, put in place interventions. Um, but it may be that you've had a, a report over, um, at the end of term and, and you're considering what your next options are. I think if you have been able to get a, an assessment done over the school holidays, it's important not to go in with all guns blazing um, and say, I've got a report and you said that uh, my child wasn't dyslexic, but look here, it says um, that they are. Um, I think try and get the Senko on your slide um, and what I would suggest is picking out um, maybe 10 points, maybe 10 strengths and weaknesses, maybe five of each, putting them in bullet points on a piece of paper and then giving those to, to the Senko and that way the Senko can then distribute those strengths and weaknesses quickly out to the relevant teacher. Now obviously a private assessment should always be the last resort but around about seven or eight is the best time for this to happen and um, that way any kind of developmental things like um, uh, reversing numbers or letters may they may have grown out of that if you haven't had an assessment done but you do have concerns and there's lots of things like the free checklist on the BDA website um, or there are some electronic screeners like the Nessie screener that are particularly good and they're quite cheap as well. Be aware that they are not diagnostic, they are only screeners and they'll look for signs of dyslexia or traits of dyslexia. 
if you do want an assessment done, the BDA have a bank of assessors and obviously I'm positive dyslexia do offer this service as well. Schools are not obliged to take privately commissioned report into consideration, but hopefully the recommendations that are given are very thorough and normally targeted and very individual for the child and they normally do take on board what has been said. There's some very good local dyslexia associations around. Um, I am going to talk at the Richmond Dyslexia Association this month um, and they often have speakers and things that come in. The BDA have fantastic Children Will Shine projects going on so there might be one of those near you as well. I will talk about quite a few different resources. I'm not paid to uh, recommend any, but these are just resources that I've come across that I think are good. So I think very important that as parents, you try and get yourself as organized as possible at the start of term. I try and get, or I used to with my children, get spares of everything. Um, I was in school yesterday doing an inset and uh, the teacher there was talking about one child who's been given five pencil cases um, and hopefully the, the thought was that they wouldn't lose all five of them. But the teachers were very supportive of this to help this particular child's organisational difficulties. At home I used to get extras of protractors, pens, highlighter pens. Um, just so that there was no excuse for my son not to have the right equipment if he left it all behind on the bus or at school. I used to scour charity shops for extra school uniform because he was always losing his, his PE kit um, and textbooks. Um, these are particularly cheap now on Amazon. I think I paid a penny for a copy of a book recently and you're just really paying for the postage and things like um, Inspector Calls or some of the other books, they've been around for about 20 years being taught in secondary school. So I know there are thousands of copies of those around. It might be that you think about putting a, a laminated, a matte laminated, not shiny laminated list on the back of the door just before um, your child leaves the door and leaves, um, leaves home for school everything that they might need that day and then they could be in charge of things themselves and it's really important that we don't promote learned helplessness we want our children to be in charge of things themselves um, I remember when my my eldest son the dyslexic son went to university and I realized that I had actually been his reasonable adjustment all that time that he'd been at school and that wasn't a really good thing for him actually There are lots of resources that you can have at home that don't cost a fortune. Um, things like um, selection of pen grips, if your child is, um, needs to use a different pen grip, try them out, have a go at a few different ones and find the one that suits them. Um, things like um, A4 files can be used for um, to, to work on, 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 the, uh, on the desk, little whiteboards. You can practice the sounds on sandpaper using plasticine or jiffy bags filled with paint, but just make it as multi-sensory as possible. Um, flexi tables are a good thing if your child has got a difficulty with times tables. And I used to print off loads of blank times squares from the internet and um, get children I was working with to put out the times square onto the um, sheet and make it quicker and quicker and quicker and I could get them down to about three minutes um, and they used to enjoy being timed and then when it came to um, doing things like um, exams and they had extra time for the maths exam then it was better for them to sit there for three minutes and put out the time square on a piece of rough paper and then they could refer to it and it just took the load off their, their working memory that way. I was talking to a teacher and, and they said that they often have a, a similar list to the one that I was talking about 
for the end of day so that um, the child could then remember their lunchbox and didn't leave their lunchbox overnight and they'd remember their PE kit or their planner and using any kind of pictures is a really good idea as well. Um, timetables are really good and um, using pictures also. A spelling dictionary. Um, if your child's got sequencing difficulties, they might not be able to use a dictionary, a conventional dictionary well. So a um, kit that you can have at home is, is a really good idea. Just make it as easy as possible for your child. This is a kind of list that you could have um, at the back of the door before you leave. And then they could just tick it off if it's on laminated paper that they've remembered that particular thing. Glasses, for example, how many times has uh, glasses been left behind? I think it's also really good if you can encourage your child's school to be dyslexia friendly. Um, actually, this is a classroom that I was in recently delivering an inset um, and I didn't find it particularly dyslexia friendly. Um, there were all these, um, can you see the, the hanging pictures in front of me? And there was actually too much information around. Um, for children who've got concentration difficulties, then there's too much sensory overload often. So um, I know there are a few teachers listening, so keeping your um, classroom fairly, um, fairly free of any extraneous information, making sure anything um, is not on white paper, making sure that if you're laminating it's on matte paper, um, using a dyslexia friendly font where you can as well. This was a um, sheet that uh, I picked up from a school that they were they were doing spelling and I just liked it because it was um, it was quite dyslexia friendly um, so they'd broken down the, the spellings into just a few um, instead of having so sort of 10 or 20 spellings which can be very very difficult for dyslexic children to to retain they may they may learn them for the spelling test but they don't retain them um, but having them uh, broken down to probably five is is much easier um, and and I quite like this as something that's quite quite multi-sensory and then another school I was in uh, recently um, I went into the staff room and this was um, in the staff room and they had actually asked the children their thoughts and um, it, I just thought it was wonderful that they'd actually asked the children what they thought and put it up in the staff room. You said it's confusing if it goes too fast and some teachers talk too much. So what are they going to do about it? The teacher's going to give the children more thinking time. You said, I hate it when I don't know what I'm being asked. The teacher's going to start with simple questions to check if you understand. And also they were trying to address the fact that it needs to be more fun and use a range of strategies. So. I just thought that was lovely. Again, it was all to do with speaking out. Sometimes the teacher doesn't see that I don't understand and the teachers were therefore going to give daily opportunities to ask questions and feedback and make it more visual. Lots more pictures, picture timetables, pictures with new words and pictures with some instructions. Children had also said that they can't keep it all in their head, so that they were going to use lesson summary sheets to help them. Another thing I often get told is that teachers leave um, information up on the whiteboard um, and they move on too quickly, they don't leave it up long enough. So just simple things like that will make it much, much easier for, for your child if you're able to talk to the teacher about that. I think it's really important that children aren't overloaded with too much verbal information as well. So breaking down into steps and checking understanding. Maybe ask about home 
homework as well. So a lot of schools have now got electronic homework sharing and this works really well. Um, uh, except another child that I was speaking to, um, the school has sent home all of the homework for the term, um, but the child had thought that was the homework for the weekend and spent the whole weekend trying to do the term's homework because it hadn't been explained to them properly. Other schools I come across, the teachers will print out the homework and glue it in the planner for the child or ensure that there's a, a buddy that puts in the homework for them. Or other schools with older children allow them to use the mobile phone to take a picture of the whiteboard and then they've got a record of it when they get back home. There are some very good resources out there that, that do help um, in primary and secondary. So these are just a few things I've come across. Teach Your Monster to Read and Roy the Zebra are both free resources on the internet. Pinterest has wonderful stuff on there that will help as well. Um, Times Tables Rockstars, uh, it's not free, but it is fairly cheap per year. And, and then the Flexi Tables that uh, I was talking about earlier, and they're on a base of flexible plastic so that the child can work out what the um, Times Table is. And, and they're only a few pounds, I think. Touch typing, fantastic. Um, I'd really encourage any child um, who has difficulty with handwriting to do a, a touch typing program after the age of nine. So the BBC Dance Mat is a free touch typing program, but there are some other ones that are specifically for dyslexic children like English Type Junior and Senior or Touch Type Read and Spell, which help with literacy as well. For secondary, um, have a look at the um, at Grammarly, which is a free spell checker. Um, things like Dragon are now preloaded onto most laptops and that's speech to text software and they can load them on their phone or their iPad. Um, and this uh, on the right hand side, the picture there is on Call Scotland's Wheel of Apps um, and you can access this uh, free Wheel of Apps um, and show it looks all of, um, has all of the free apps that you can find for reading, spelling, comprehension, maths, and there's a really good, um, lots of really good examples there. And then some other things that will help with revising. Quizbook, fantastic as well, so they can test themselves. And um, a couple of memory apps there as well, and memory um, links as well, because obviously this is a real problem with revision because of their difficulties with working memory, they can't cram for an exam. They have to start revising a lot more in advance than other children and find different ways into their learning. Barrington Stoke books are fantastic for dyslexic children if you haven't come across those and those are printed on, on buff coloured paper, make it much easier to read. Um, many dyslexics prefer reading from Kindles because the grey background is much easier for them also and the Kindle can also be preloaded with dyslexia friendly text. There's one on there called Open Dyslexic. The RNRB Bookshare is also very good and that was a joint project between Dyslexia Action and the RNIB and I think they have digitalised nearly 300,000 books so far and you can have free access to that. So if you go onto the RNIB um, website you can find out more information about that. So what next as parents? Um, don't forget Dyslexia Awareness Week. It's on the first week of October and really encourage schools to celebrate dyslexia rather than focusing on any negative points that you, your child or other children may have. The BDA produce information for assemblies and they also have a wonderful cartoon on their YouTube channel which explains dyslexia in a very accessible way to, to children. BDA have been running roadshows for parents and I know that they have still got a couple of roadshows left that they're doing and um, have a look at the BDA films on the YouTube channel which also look at things like spelling or multisensory learning as well. And finally, um, Positive Dyslexia are actually holding our first conference in Liverpool on November the 8th um, and 
we've got a fabulous range of speakers there and um, Helen Bowden who's the CEO of the BDA is going to open it for us and we've got people like Pete Jarrett talking about dyscalculia, um, Neil Mackay talking about dyslexia friendly strategies for the classroom and John Hicks in particular is going to be doing a free workshop um, from 4 to 4.30 that you can access and he does a wonderful blog um, for parents as well so um, I think um, Don is going to give uh, um, access for everyone who's listening to his uh, webinar that he just did for the BTA. So hopefully I'll say half an hour is not a lot of time to go through an awful lot of information but hopefully you've picked up a few useful things there. Um, this is my email address here, Katrina at positive dyslexia.co.uk, and my website is below, which has also got some information for parents on there. Um, and I am very happy to answer any questions um, that you send me by email. But we have got a little bit of time. I don't mind answering some questions now as well, Donna, if you have any that have been sent in or anybody wants to ask any questions. Thank you so much, Katrina. And um, yes, we'll we'll try and get through a couple. Uh, just to reinforce what you said, um, we we will indeed share John Hicks's uh, webinar with with our parents this evening. That will come through when we have the link for your session as well. He's talking from a parent's perspective how to support a child. And actually, I was thinking, Katrina, whilst I was listening to you this evening, I think we'll share. Uh, Aaron Smith from Microsoft's free webinar yes. as well I think yes. I'm glad you think that's a good idea so that also uh, for all our listeners this evening that Aaron talks about all the free uh, fantastic facilities on Microsoft that we most of us have got in Windows for our older learners and us adults as well so we'll share some freebies with you also um, please do message Helpline and Katrina if you've got further questions. If in doubt, come through to us in conference and we'll signpost the way. So let's squeeze in a few questions before we finish this mini session. Um, after school clubs, Katrina, we've got a lady called Jeanette. Good evening, Jeanette. She's asking about um, the idea that we should be after school. You spoke about children often being tired who've got mm. new neurodiverse. Is it a good idea to be taking them to swimming, karate and so on and so forth or should we give, be given the more downtime after school? Obviously it's you know some some downtime would be nice but it, it's so difficult especially if you're a working parent as well you may need to put them in an after school club so I think it's just having the balance isn't it and it's just understanding your child may be exhausted it's 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 that understanding that's so important isn't it? Um, but obviously, you know, usual things, a snack, reinvigorate them. But actually, you know, some movement can really help as well, can't it? Yeah, so just getting the balance, I think. Mm. Um, Sarah's asking, you put that image up of the ACE spelling dictionary. Oh, yes. I'm just yes. wondering, why is that different to a regular dictionary, please, Katrina? Oh. <laughs> actually, um, it's, it's grouped by sound rather than by um, letters. Mm. It's grouped by sound. And if you're dyslexic, you find it much, much easier. Um, I'll try and go back to the to the, to the picture. So. Yeah, that's the one. Um, I because I'm not dyslexic, I don't understand how it works. Um, but uh, which which seems odd for me to say, but I know dyslexic children find it much, much easier. They are no more than about fifteen pounds, and you could probably get a second hand one from Amazon as well. Um, but they they really do help um, at both the primary and secondary as the secondary version just come out as well. Fantastic. And um, Sarah's just said thank you to that uh, for that. We've got another question. Um, Ian, a follow up question about the, this dictionary. Um, Ian's asking about age groups. But I think you've probably just answered that, Katrina. Mm. You? So there's a yeah. secondary version as well, you've said. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, I'm just quickly scanning these questions. Um, I think this is Rebecca. Hello, Rebecca. She says, I was interested in the comment about private assessments. As there are very few LA services left, many parents do commission high quality reports. Why do these have less credibility? So are we still in the situation, Katrina, where if a parent's gone off to source a private assessment, is that not as 
good, if you like, as a as one generated by school, or where are we at with that now, please? Oh, it's such a shame. I, I mean, obviously, um, it would be an educational psychologist who would um, do an assessment for a local authority generally. Um, and there is still this sort of idea that the psychologist reports are better. Um, I am a, a, an assessor and I assess children and adults, but I've also got a lot of experience working in the classroom. So often the specialist teacher reports are sometimes better because they really understand what the child needs and, and can do can give really detailed recommendations. Um, but it is, there is this, this slight dichotomy, isn't there? I'd say in my experience, um, they won't generally um, trigger an education, health and care plan, but for many parents, it's, it's the child who is a bit better than the child, a little bit better than the child who's gonna get an educational health and care plan that's not getting the support that they need. Um, particularly the bright children as well, who are coming up on maybe average in terms of um, the attainments, but not reaching their potential. So um, for those parents, sometimes the private report is very helpful. However, I must say that sometimes I tell parents, think very carefully about having an, a private assessment. Maybe if you've got some money, spend it on the tuition, find a really good specialist teacher VDA again has got tutor list of specialist teachers and have the tuition instead of spending on the report um, at that particular point so it's it's very much um, uh, an individual choice but um, you know it, it's um, it's something that perhaps you have to think very carefully about yes and um, Rebecca please do reach out to us at BDA we're happy to support you with independent advice really and I'm um, and mm. same really message to Nicola now because Nicola is also asking Katrina that you said this evening a private diagnosis is almost a last resort but there doesn't seem to be any other route she's saying is it worthwhile my daughter is eight eight is a really good age to have the assessment done um, but I would um, look at all the different factors first. I would make sure that your child has um, a hearing test, has a sight test first, if, if they haven't had one done recently, um, and just look at all the other possibilities also. Um, you can do one of the, the checklists, as I say, download it from the BTA website, um, maybe do one of the online screeners, um, and, and find out exactly what's going on. Um, the school may well have put some things in place and maybe give the, the school a chance to put those things, those interventions, um, let them work. But as I say, eight's a good time to get your child assessed, particularly if there's dyslexia in the family, um, you know, because it is genetic. But as I say, as I'm saying, we will give you further advice on that and, and uh, we will look at things and give you, give you further advice. Yeah, thanks, Katrina. So again, for Nicola, who's just been talking about her daughter, please do reach back out to us, Nicola. We are here to help you and give you some impartial advice about the best way ahead for you guys. Um, OK, so I, in the spirit of keeping this session short, Katrina, we will draw a line <laughs> under it now. We could go on and on, but we'll we'll try yeah. our best to keep it a bite sized one. We might have, to, have to have you back if that's OK. Oh, pleasure. Better luck with your children this term. And I mean, what, another thing to bear in mind is that they do get there in the end. It may be a very frustrating, traumatic experience at the moment, getting a child back to school, starting again. Um, but they do get there in the end. But it's it can be quite a long journey together. Yeah. And BDA are, are right with you all. If you need us, we are here. Yeah. Um, so please do keep in touch with us. As Katrina said, we do have these free road shows, pop up road shows, as we call them, traveling the country currently. Our next one is towards the end of September in Leeds. And then we move to Chester and North Wales. And we're looking at new ones in 2020 as well. So we will also share the link for our events page. That's where the latest road shows will appear. And we would love to have you all come along to whichever is closest to you and find out more. So um, I just want to end by saying a huge thank you to you, Katrina. Thank you so much. Oh, pleasure.
and thank you to all our listeners. We will be sharing Katrina's recording. I'm very aware there's some very useful links on there. And the BDA will also send you some free goodies that we also think will be useful, some other webinars and some links to useful resources. So here's to a fantastic autumn term. Please do keep in touch with us and we hope you have a great rest of the evening. Good night, everybody.